climate change, human-induced climate change, anthropogenic materials in the environment, um, our industrialization, our supply chains, our infrastructure, all of these things are leaving a lasting imprint on nature. And I want to help people understand what those, those things look like. Because if you think about the supply chain, it's this really abstract kind of concept. But you can concretize it by turning it into an object. Uh, I might get into some of that later. We'll see. Um, but the project that we're going to talk about today is this. It's called Implements for Future Glacial Scouring. And we're moving into a warmer climate. The last glacier that we experienced here on Earth uh, was 40,000 years ago. No one was here for that. It shaped much of this region. Last year, about this time, I was under Lake Erie. I got a tour of the salt mine. And it was pretty, it was pretty amazing. There's this body of salt that moves all the way from eastern New York, all the way up to northern Michigan, and then down into West Virginia. And, it covered, and it's completely covered by glacial clay. So 40,000 years ago, and in the periods of glaciation prior to that, Clay was pushed down from Canada. 2,000 feet of clay was pushed down from Canada and covered this body of salt. So um, this region, Cleveland in particular, and then the Great Lakes region, has been influenced by uh, glaciers for a very long time. We have the Great Lakes because of the glaciers, but we also have the soil here because of the glaciers. And then there's, there's places in the landscape where the glaciers have scoured away uh, the soil and exposed bedrock. Has, has anyone been to Kelly's Island to see the glacial groups there? So you know, like this is a massive thing. Um, there, I have some pictures of this in a second. But glaciers came down and carved these massive grooves into uh, blocks of limestone. And as we move towards uh, a warmer climate, the next period of glaciation we're actually going to skip. It should occur sometime within the next 50,000 years. But because of the acceleration of climate change, we are going to move out of this glacial period and then move into something called a, a greenhouse state. So glaciers can only occur during ice house states. Um, they can't occur during greenhouse states. And this is some background. I'll get to some things in a moment. But uh, it's important to know that right now, even though it's kind of warm and we don't have a lot of glaciers, we're in an ice house state. And we're rapidly moving out. So the next time a glacier that could utilize the types of things I'm going to talk about. The next time a glacier would occur here on Earth of that scale uh, would be somewhere in the next 100,000 years. So when I talk about designing something for the deep future, this is kind of hubris because I don't fool myself in thinking that my, my object is going to be here in 100,000 years. But going back to that concept of reifying and, and concretizing these abstract concepts in something that calls attention to uh, our impact on the environment. That's kind of what I'm trying to do. So this is, uh, these are just some little feely pictures I took of um, different elements that I think represent some of the major climatic regimes that we're going to experience in the next 100,000 years. So um, starting, starting from the left, uh, there's this, this moment of intense heat uh, and as we start to burn out, humanity will eventually die off. And then after, after that die off, that mass extinction, uh, and the Earth reaches equilibrium again, we'll come back to a moment of glacial, of glacial activity. So it'll be another ice age. And then it'll start to thaw. And as it thaws, some land will be covered with water, some will be covered with dirt. There'll be a lot of falling. And then things will start to come back, right? And we'll have what you have here on the right, I think it's fall cypress. You'll have some plants that grow again. And uh, I want to talk about, what I'm talking about is building something that will endure these climatic regimes all the way to that final state. So let me walk you through my creative process a little bit. I'm interested in mark making like a lot of people are. But um, glaciers, I think, are one of these things that make marks that uh, have been kind of inspirational to me. So if you don't know about the processes that a glacier uses, uh, that circle on the left, uh, the white member is representative of a glacier, and then it's, it's carrying a rock, and that rock is being used as a cutting tool <coughs> right into uh, the substrate. This is a little sketch I made of the profile of Kelly's Island glacial curves, if you've been there. So this is kind of what it looks like. And a lot of different rocks and glacial erratics were used to carve these grooves, these flutes, into the, into the bedrock. And it leaves this, this section 
what that would what that what that would produce in terms of glacial fluting and striation. Um, and I, I kind of think you might be able to. We'll get there looking at some things. Uh, these are some images of the Kelly's Island glacial groups. Um, the scale. The largest group is probably the size of this room. Uh, three times its length. So it's this wide and then three times the length of this room. And moving on to uh, this idea of being a human agent and affecting change in the landscape, I started to experiment, experiment with like building a tool to kind of uh, carve into the growth. And uh, this, this idea of performing geomorphology that I took into making this, this object. It's a, it's a small little uh, poplar frame that holds a block of ice. And in that block of ice are embedded three pieces of granite. And these pieces of granite uh, represent the glacial erratics that a glacier would use to, to cut. They stand in for that represent it. And um, I'm using this in a back and forth motion, kind of, kind of mimetic of carpentry, uh, but then also the use of some uh, corn grinding techniques with the mono And uh, so I have this block of limestone and I'm taking this, this, this block of ice with the, with the pieces of granite in it and grinding, scribing a line into it. So I'm starting to make a mark. And here I'm trying to embody the glacial force because I'm holding um, the agency that a glacier has when it's moving. Um, some of it is given to the glacier by gravity. Some of it's given to it by uh, different thermal conditions of the substrate, uh, the acceleration of meltwater, glacial melt that it produces. And so what I'm doing is I'm coming onto this, this block of ice and turning it into the, the cutting tool to scribe a line. So this, this made me start to think about glaciers as uh, something that I could use to not just scribe a line, but relate it to other work that I do. Uh, I'm interested in supply chains and how supply chains have moved natural materials faster and farther than nature ever could. And one of those materials that they move is a building material. It's granite. Uh, they move marble. They move all kinds of all kinds of materials. But granite, in particular, um, is mimetic of uh, the glacial erratic because there's there's anytime you're in a field and you see a stone that's very large, if it's a granite stone and you're in this region more than likely that came from Canada because in this region of the Great Lakes we don't have a lot of granite. So um, what would happen is a glacier would come down and push this piece of granite into the environment and, uh, and leave it there and melt and there'd be this lonely stone out there. Uh, so glaciers move granite really far but at a really slow pace. But Home Depot moves granite from India and from China and from Ukraine really fast and really fast. In fact, it's faster and farther than nature ever can move things. And so I wanted to find a way to, uh, to play with that formal idea. Um, I skipped something. One day I was at a countertop warehouse. I just wanted to go in. I was driving by and I see all the stacks of granite by the side of the road. So I got out of my car, walked in, and I'm looking at their cutting bed. And at the bottom of the bed is this slurry. And it's uh, this, this glacial slurry. Um, but it's, it's ground up granite that um, as they're cutting, cutting the granite slabs with the water, um, the particulate granite is settling down and, and forming this slurry bed on the bottom. And that's one of the things that glaciers do. So it got me thinking a little more about that. Um, as a glacier moves and abrades stone, it wears it away, it polishes it. It incorporates pieces of bedrock. And it produces this, this silt, uh, glacial till, glacial silt. A lot of that's what's over Lake Erie. So I started to think, is there a way that I could take this idea of um, the supply chain moving uh, granite and incorporate that into some kind of performative aspect? So um, I took a piece of granite backsplash, um, and I, I'm using it here as a, as a plane to carve the face of a stone. And so what I did is I had this rough piece of stone and I polished it. And I, I spent five hours going back and forth with my body, 
taking this piece of granite, in this case I'm the ice, right? I'm holding the granite, I'm pushing it against the, against the, the rock material, and I'm using it to polish. And so I started thinking about this, how, um, how this could be a kind of way to launch into, some, into a new way of thinking about the environment. This is kind of abstract, but these are a bunch of infrastructural cutting tools that already exist in the landscape and in the built environment and in our infrastructural networks. Um, all of these things, yes, they'll yield the sedimentation. Sedimentary forces are really powerful, but some of them will still be around. Uh, probably, probably not so much these. These will yield the sedimentation, but things like plastic. Um, I, I was walking down the beach after a hurricane two years ago, um, and I picked up this giant blob of uh, waste purge from a plastic injection molding factory, and I still have it. It's, 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 it's this, uh, it's almost like a boulder, but it's a piece of plastic, and this is waste, and people throw this out. And um, I've since then started talking to plastics factories, and um, these are the kinds of things that aren't going to break down. They have UV, um, they, they, they degrade in UV environments, but uh, over time they're still going to persist and they're still going to be these things that are available to become cutting tools for a future glacier. So um, I started looking at these, all these things in the, um, in, in the infrastructure and I thought, well what if I could take small objects and combine them in sequences and produce um, certain effects. So I, I, made, I made a bunch of, this is in plan view, um, I made a bunch of little stones out of uh, high density carbon foam and I, arrayed, I lined them out in different arrays and I uh, just thought about like, okay, if I sequence them this way, what, what kind of section view would I expect? And um, so then I, I started to make these little little section views of um, what I would anticipate uh, different patterns and sequencings that I've designed uh, to produce in an environment. And so these are just, these are some little forms. And I, uh, I think this implements for future glacial scouring has kind of morphed. It's, it's still a work in progress, but um, I started to think about, okay, I've got these objects and I'm going to place these objects, but is there something else that I could do that would be um, interesting or useful that would explore the direct connection between the supply chain and, uh, and the marks that we leave on Earth? So um, I started looking at some materials and that stack of granite in the middle uh, is in my shop right now. I've got 18 slabs of it, and it's all from the Ukraine. But I'm, what I'm doing with it is I'm I'm, a, I'm reconstructing a granite boulder. I brought my map pads with me, so um, let's start passing these around. So I have this. This is like a lamination of granite. Um, you go to Home Depot and you buy granite countertops, and uh, sometimes you're going to get things that are, you're going to get granite that um, occurred in like book matched formations, but um, but not always. But I wanted to I wanted to play around with this idea of of taking granite and then bringing it together with a piece of threaded rod. This isn't stainless, but I'll use stainless in my larger piece. This is. Uh, just galvanized, but um, it's kind of mimetic of a boulder. Um, but then you also see this rigidity of of the straight line. And then if you're approaching it um, from this direction, you see this this polished face. So you know there's a couple there's a couple indications on this that this is not a natural object. But at the same time, um, it is very natural. And so this would be one of the implements for future glacial scouring that I would use in a sequence. So um, in fact, I've got these different. I'll pass this around. So um, I've got these different these different objects, and each one of them fills a different function. So uh, I'll just, this is the reconstructed granite boulder. This next one is called Icebox, and 
this this is obviously my cut size, but um, it'll be produced at uh, a, at a dumpster scale, like an apartment eight by eight by eight cube dumpster scale, and it'll be placed in the environment um, to collect rainwater. As as we move into a more wet condition, uh, what'll happen is uh, we'll start to experience rain again, and rain will fill this this up and then freeze. And then the idea is that once it's become a block of ice, this block of ice will have a plow function. So it can plow swales into um, whatever the glacial clay is. And it's swales that I predefined by cutting and, and forging into this formation. So. The next one, um, acrylic encapsulated salt boulders. So I have 6,000 pounds of salt in my shop, um, and I needed to find something to do with it. <laughs> so I started embedding, um, I, these are just little flakes of it, I, the, the ones that I have are massive. But I started embedding it in resin and uh, acrylic. So the idea behind this is as, as a glacier picks something like this up, um, it slowly starts to abrade the plastic away. The plastic has preserved the salt until the moment that the glacier is there. So uh, uh, it's kind of acting as like a shell to increase the longevity of the salt. But then the salt will encounter the ice and start to melt the ice to, to change the shape of, the, of the, the bottom of the glacier so that it might influence the way that things are carved. Um, the rasp rock is basically uh, stainless steel expanded metal. Uh, the idea is that as it moves over the landscape, it picks up debris until it kind of becomes like a like gabion, I guess. Um, and then the pigment core, I didn't bring that out there, but it's, um, there are these encaustic structures that I made that are, that, that will be embedded in, um, in a harder sub substance so that as they're pushed by the glacier, they leave a streak. Um, seed pod, this is kind of an interesting one for me. Uh, Obviously, seeds don't last 100,000 years. Um, you can't really do anything to protect a seed for 100,000 years and you still have it be viable. But um, this is where the social engagement part comes in in a few minutes. Uh, this idea of being able to distribute certain seeds in certain configurations as, um, and, and predicting what that uh, planting would look like, uh, that's one of the things that I wanted to play with here. The classic boulder. Um, going back to this purge that I talked about a minute ago, 95% of pollution in the ocean is plastic, um, and it doesn't degrade the way that a lot of things degrade. And yes, we're talking about new and new types of plastic that would uh, consume, that, that could be consumed by mushrooms and things like that, but still there's going to be a lot of HTP, ABS. Even PLA has a footprint though, right? And um, Kaysen has a footprint. All of these plastic alternatives, um, they still have some kind of impact that they leave on the environment. So I wanted to find a way to make uh, plastic into, into something in this, in this project. And here's some of these pieces of plastic purge. Um, and then this faceted stainless boulder. Um, here in Cleveland, uh, the Forging Industry Association uh, is, is headquartered here in Cleveland, and they're one of my tentative partners in producing uh, a stainless steel cutting boulder. So this would be um, about the size of a camping cooler, um, faceted, hammered into, into these shapes to become this tool to cut into the landscape. I showed you these things, so we're going to look at this. This is, a, this is that ice box, and I have it, I'm pushing it into glacial clay so you can kind of see, like, this is what the effect would be. This is sediment clay that I dug up in a glacial field here in Ohio. So, this, having, having these tools, um, you've got this, this ability to sequence these different cutting tools to produce different effects in the section view. Um, but there's also considerations aesthetically that you have to take. Um, you have to think about uh, the substrate hardness, how you would apply 
um, which stone and where, um, but then also like the tools, uh, how, how will the tools degrade over time? Will they start to disintegrate and um, as they're being pushed by the glacier? And so this is the part where um, this starts to become more of a language. And um, by having, having an array of tools um, that serve different functions, that have different, uh, different uh, characteristics, uh, they afford being placed in the environment in different configurations. So I'm working right now to specify what, what a playbook would look like for that. So um, like if you used this, this, and this, uh, this is the kind of profile that you would expect. And um, so um, thinking about being able to, to visualize what um, what the effects of these stones would be. I'm kind of glossing over uh, some of the significance of why I would want to do this, but I'm hoping that as, as we start to talk about um, emotional design, that will become more clear. So clearly, 100,000 years, nobody really thinks that they can design anything that will last that long. Um, or if they do, they're, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> uh, so, this idea of social engagement comes in, as, as we start to experience the instability of climate change, as people start to see that resources are more and more scarce, as natural ice becomes this thing that is non-existent, and some people don't ever know what, what ice looks like, um, a lot of uh, security questions about the future predict instability, social instability. But one thing we know about um, ritual is that ritual helps people deal with uncertainty. And so I wanted to find a way to tie in um, these objects into some kind of social cultural ritual practice that would help um, preserve the object as a measure of conservation, but then also um, continually remind people. So if you think about like a monument, a monument serves a couple of functions, like uh, it serves this function to uh, remember, um, and it serves uh, the function of honoring. Um, and monuments obviously have a lot of weird political things tied to them, but uh, in this case, uh, the objects themselves, um, when they're produced at full scale, are mimetic of uh, natural objects that are things like rocks, and uh, but they're presented in forms that are um, very human looking. You probably don't want to touch that. Um, I don't think this project, projects like this would, would survive without social engagement. So. Part of, um, I proposed this one project to this gallery in Toronto and it got rejected, but I'm gonna tell you about it because um, <laughs> the idea is kind of what helped me um, think about the ideas that I wanna use in this social engagement piece. And I found this, this piece of granite in a limestone field in Ohio and it was there by itself and it ostensibly was carried by a glacier and I picked it up, it's 38 pounds. It's kind of rounded and smooth, um, but there's some, there's some marks there, so you know it's seen some, some heavy abrasion. Um, it came from Canada, and I thought, as an act of reparations, I will return this rock to Canada, <laughs> and I will carry it there. So I was gonna, I, I proposed carrying it to Toronto, which is only like 300 miles. Um, and 38 pounds, I mean, it's not that heavy. People backpack, and um, so I was, I was thinking, I'll carry this there, and as I'm carrying it, it'll be an act of penance, almost. Uh, uh, like a penitent walk, um, carrying this object. And then I was planning to install it on a plinth in the gallery, and then have people come in and venerate this object by placing chips of Toronto ice water. Uh, Toronto, Toronto tap water ice on top of the piece of granite and letting it melt. 
But it wasn't just going to melt at room temperature. I was going to elevate the room to the temperature that Toronto will be at 2100. So um, that's um, 11 degrees warmer than it is right now. So obviously, I, would have, I wouldn't walk to Toronto in the middle of winter. But um, this, this would happen in the summer. And that would, that would serve a rhetorical purpose of highlighting um, the fact that, OK, there's this warmth. It's, it's warm outside. Why are we heating the gallery? OK, we're elevating the temperature of the gallery. It's uncomfortable. Um, and so all of these things would uh, work together to produce this environment of altered thermal states that um, place you in a deep future state, right? Like 2100 might as well be deep future for us because it's not, it's, we've got a lot of lived experience to have before that. And I will never see it probably. But, uh, um, but being able to put people in that experience of that environment, um, ambient temperatures, and then have them do this ritualistic act of placing pieces of ice onto the granite and letting it melt, ablating the piece of granite with the melt water as it runs down. Um, I wanted I wanted to like have this little ritual there to um, to help people say they're sorry to the earth. And uh, so one of the, one of the things that I was thinking um, of incorporating that into this project is by um, there's there's three phases to this project. Um, and I, I didn't want to talk about this, but I'm go I'll just briefly mention it. Um, there's a gallery ex exhibition of the maquettes and models. Um, there's a site installation, and then there's also a book that Punkham is publishing on this. And in the book, 50% um, of it's project documentation, and then the rest of it, um, I've got uh, several people that I'm really excited about that I'll tell you after the canvas turned off. Um, who are going to be writing and critiquing the work, uh, but I don't want to give it away just yet. So in that in that section, um, I'm going to lay out this protocol for um, conservation practices for the objects. So how frequently you need to check to make sure that uh, the the acrylic hasn't worn off or degraded. Uh, whether or not you need to see if frost has um, moved between the, the pieces of granite and the reconstructed boulder and whether or not you need to bolt another piece of granite on, uh, whether or not the, the welds are watertight still um, in, in the ice box. Um, so it'll, there'll be like these, this, this protocol of things that you need to do, but then they'll be tied in with uh, ritual acts as well. We're kind of already good at preserving um, human stones, human altered stones in the environment because um, people here some of these flowers that people have put by the graves, there's usually a grave with their finger. But this is something, this is an example of how, how this concept actually is already happening. These are pieces of granite that come from quarries that we don't know. Who knows where they came from, right? So um, they're moved. It's not like the olden days where it was something local that you used a piece of stone. This is like, this is moved massive distances. And uh, it's depleting uh, different granite reserves to uh, honor the dead. But so we make these we make these um, these tombstones, and then we place them in the environment in arrays. They're lined up. It's determined by the shape and length of the human body, the distance placed between them. But um, one day these will be fields that will be ripe for a glacier to take the pieces of granite and start to grind into the ground. So whether or not my project ever happens, it already has happened here. Um, and people start to preserve. Um, people go, they, they, they take flowers, they, they brush off the tombstone, they make sure it's clean, they respect their dead ancestors in that way. And in some way, I think these types of objects for implements for future glacial scouring, I think that these will be things that people can also venerate and look to see um, this is something that we need to preserve as our as our cultural heritage, um, and obviously all of this this leads to the idea of making the last human mark on Earth after humans have gone extinct. And uh, yes, it's hubris, but um, it's also highlighting that our infrastructure already does this. Um, This is a picture of a glacier. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there and start answering questions. Kelly.
you'll see uh, these smooth faces, but then as, as you walk past it, um, and then you turn around, you have a different encounter, right? So um, I wanted to make objects that, um, that did reference, uh, well, they don't all reference the material, but some of them do. And I wanted them to be um, uh, these idealized, uh, th these idealized prototypical objects, basically. So it's not um, based necessarily on how they are, you anticipate them physically affecting the environment, uh, but more about a human-centric in the now kind of design moment. Kind of a schoolmate class scholar. So. Um, In that top <coughs> left quadrant, there's a bridge, and um, those pillars in that bridge, when they come down, they would obviously carve at the very end in a kind of form. Um, these, I, I kind of want them to tumble a little bit, um, but some of, some of the ones that I didn't include um, are kind of like those pillars. Um, the Coming to terms with glacial now, that piece where I'm taking um, the piece of ice and moving it back and forth, it's this very, it's like woodworking almost, and I made some other tools that are kind of like wood planes, that, um, but they're, they're made, they're made to be deployed in the environment um, in long, they're long cylinders that are kind of like these pillars, and they have little blades inserted into them to act as a plane. So in that case, yeah, I wanted something very long and linear. Um, but things like this, it's going to tumble and abrade, and it's going to produce something linear also. And the, the plan view of some of my anticipations for how these things play out, um, it, it's, it's fluted but comes into these, um, these big truncated cones, basically. So as this is, as this is rolling, and getting smaller and smaller and smaller, obviously the groove that it makes is going to become smaller. So it's going to, the direction of travel of the glacier would produce these long pointed forms. And those pointed forms would, indi would be indicators of the direction of travel and also um, a trace of uh, the elements that the, the stone was made of. But uh, since there's no one there to see it, I don't know. Um, what good it does other than being able to like, allow us to simulate it. And um, yeah, so they're, they're not all intentional, but um, some of them are, I guess. Yes. Um, so I thought something pretty interesting that you've done in, in trying to make these moves is create a series of artifacts as well as their sort of long-term effects on uh, geography. In the future, I guess, do you imagine that the difference between something like the, the salt and acrylic um, and the icebox will have an impact, whereas the icebox is probably going to be left somewhere where the acrylic will disappear? And I guess a sub-question would be, do you imagine someone dragging your granite construction back to Canada too? Back to Canada. Oh. For some gallery piece. Um, well, I mean, once it's deployed, then it's probably up to vandals, their ingenuity, and how they would get at it. But, um, yeah, uh, people, people who carry it back to Canada. Um, yeah, these will definitely, this will, this will persist in the environment. Um, but I imagine as a glacier is pushing against miles of substrate, the bottom will start to wear out. Um, but the form, some trace of the form will still be there. I think if, if I write the protocol right and people feel socially compelled to preserve it, maybe people won't destroy it, but that's always an option. Things. I meant uh, like post post glacial, oh. way 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 in the future. Um, Just as an interesting thought, to be Sure. <laughs> I uh, I kind of think everyone will be dead by then. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, 
there's different views of it. So your, your question is very valid. So, um, yeah. But I'm, I'm of the view that I'm going to move on to that. Yes? Have you ever thought about this type of experiment on another planet, like a Mars type gravity setting or a moon type gravity setting? No, I haven't. I think that'd be really compelling to see on Mars what type of effect this would have as well with similar energies to Earth as well. So I was just sure. curious about that. Yeah. No, I haven't. Um, that's interesting. There's a lot of space junk that could yeah. be converted into objects. <laughs> That's a trace that we leave. Yeah. Yes? Um, I thought it was interesting when you were talking about how like, um, like people remember in and like that, but um, how did you, I guess, or did you think of how people actually go to these places or monuments and like, I guess, how technology influences it and like how it influences the experience of all these places? So, I don't know, like augmented reality or There's this man that's doing some interesting work in Germany, maybe. And if anyone knows about him, tell me, because I can't remember his name. But he's taken some granite boulders that he's found and cut voids into them, and then inserted uh, routers that um, anyone can walk by the stone and download a packet that is preset to, uh, to, to like upload to your device. And the way that it's powered, it's completely autonomous. The way that it's powered is um, either through uh, solar heat, like from, it's, it's heat based, um, or from lighting a fire next to a metal plate that you attach to the other side of the boulder that's hooked up to some like conducting uh, power generating source. So um, it's completely standalone and uh, I don't know, I, I was pretty intrigued by his project. But no, I haven't thought of that for mine. Uh, I sometimes am kind of brutalist in my approach. <laughs> Thank you, though. You thought about additive tools? Like you just sort of subtractive tools? Um, so, kind of. I haven't thought of that in this, in this, um, in this particular instance. I, uh, so I do have a little critique going right now about 3D printing pens. Um, I don't know if this is the place to say it or not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not I'm, so some, some aspects of 3D printing I think are awesome and I think in the hands of the right people, um, they're great, but Right now, we market 3D printing pens to children as, as something that's worthwhile to have. And in the last five weeks, um, there was a full-scale replica of a Nissan produced uh, with 3D printing pen and 11 designers. And it's completely functionless, other than to show, like, hey, we can draw a Nissan. And uh, like I said earlier, about 95% of ocean pollution being plastics. Like, um, it's in terms of that type of additive process, um, I, I kind of want to make my other statement before I think about it in this case, um, and that's critiquing it. But no, I haven't, I haven't thought about um, function-wise uh, an additive tool in this tool yet. I guess that's what actually what I was thinking was the, um, you know, sort of the, the, the junk in the sea kind of thing. Is that, is that, you know, could you wrap that in a way that it would sort of, sort of start to sell? Uh, that's interesting. So, are you, are you familiar with plastiglomerate? What is it? Plastiglomerate. Uh, I think it was five years ago. Geologists found a, well, they classified a new type of rock. So, beach plastic washes up out of the ocean, lands in the sand. People have beach fires on top of the sand. Beach fire melts the plastic. It drips down, enters the vesicles of basalt lava, and uh, then enters the sedimentary profile of that, of that lake. Stratigraphy, and um, 
So they found this plastic conglomerate. It's it's plastic and rock, and it's the first it's the first classified anthropogenic rock, I guess you would say. Um, and that would be that. Would, so like harvesting things from the ocean and then turning them into an object. That that I could see how that that could be something like that. But no, I haven't thought of it. Um, thank you for bringing up. Line, and that, that's a way to indicate salience in the communication of 